The Railway and Marine News issue from November 1914 started their story of the Tahoma as follows. Quote, Reading like a romance of the sea is the graphic story of the rescue of the officers and crew of the USRC Tahoma, as told by Purser H.C. McDowell of the SS Cordova of the Alaska Steamship Company. Mr. McDowell is a well-known employee of the company, and his paper was merely a report to the officials of the company. Purser McDowell little dreamed when he wrote the report that he was producing a valuable addition to the literature of the sea, end quote. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story? The Scattered Boats of the USRC Tahoma. Here we are. Enjoy! The Tahoma had been built specifically for the Revenue Cutter Service in 1908. The 1,215-ton steel-hulled steamship was built in New Jersey, but had been intended for the west coast of the United States from the beginning. Her home port was to be Townsend, Washington, and in order to reach Townsend, it was decided it would be best to send her through the Suez Canal. The Tahoma, therefore, started her career in the Revenue Cutter Service with a long voyage that took her most of the way around the world, including a long stop in Alexandretta, Turkey, to reassure American expatriates due to unrest in the Ottoman Empire. Therefore, though she had departed from Baltimore in April 1909, she did not reach her assigned port of Townsend until late August to take up her regular duties. One of these duties would be to patrol around Alaska, looking for wildlife poachers, though she also completed other tasks, including finding and rescuing the crew of the shipwrecked steamer, the Yukon. In 1914, the Tahoma was given a new task. With war having broken out in Europe, the Tahoma was sent to enforce United States neutrality in the Bering Sea. Before departing Unalaska, a United States Deputy Marshal asked Captain Crisp, captain of the Tahoma, what his policy was when navigating the waters of Alaska. Captain Crisp responded that his only rule was to be careful. And when pressed for more detail, he simply emphasized that his only other rule was to be more careful still. It might not have been the answer that the Deputy Marshal was expecting, but it was a fair policy. The navigational hazards in the waters around Alaska were not yet fully charted. Having made the declaration of his philosophy, Captain Crisp and the Tahoma departed from Unalaska the next day to begin their patrol with 83 people on board. On the 20th of September, 1914, at 9 p.m., the Tahoma was returning from Atu Island, and was traveling about 55 miles west of Kiska Island when Captain Crisp felt the familiar and terrible feeling of rock grazing the bottom of his ship. He had been on board of the McCulloch when it had grounded on St. Paul Island in 1906, and so he immediately recognized the sensation and rushed to the deck. Before he could reach the deck, Captain Crisp heard the signal given to back the ship, but it was too late. The Tahoma came hard onto a reef with a horrible sound. Now, Captain Crisp had trouble even walking the deck. Though the sea was calm, the ship was still rocking hard on the rocks, causing the entire ship to shake. The bosun immediately gave the order to prepare to abandon ship, but Captain Crisp was now properly on deck and reversed the order telling the crew to only get the boats ready to launch quickly, in case they did need to abandon the ship. Though the Tahoma's engines were now trying to back the ship at full power, this only caused the ship to jump around on the rocks more, and caused more damage. Captain Crisp gave the order to employ the searchlight to try to see what had happened. He could not see any land nearby. 
With the light of the searchlight, Captain Crisp was able to see the very faint signs of a reef under the water, and he was still trying to make it out when the vessel, straining to get off the reef, caused it to shake so badly that the searchlight supports were broken, and he lost his light source. He would later say that he felt that if it had been daylight, he trusted that his deck crew would have recognized the signs of the reef and avoided it, as faint as they were. But traveling in the dark as they had been, and with the reef not appearing on any chart, they had no warning until they struck. Soon, the main steam pipe in the engine room also began to break under the stress that was being put on it, and Captain Crisp put an end to attempts to get the ship off of the reef. He was worried that, with much more damage to the ship, there was a chance that the pipe would give out entirely and scald the engine crew. Water was beginning to fill the ship now, and the pumps were out of commission, as was the rudder. The Tahoma was tilted at a 45-degree angle with her bow towards the water and her stern in the air. It was becoming increasingly clear to Captain Crisp that there was no chance that he would be able to save the Tahoma. Even if they were able to float off the reef, the ship was now so damaged that they would immediately sink to the bottom. A wireless message had already been sent to the commander in Unalaska, letting him know that they had grounded on a reef, but now a new message was sent, informing the commander of their need to abandon ship. The commander responded to their message by telling them that a Japanese ship, the Tacoma Maru, was near them, and he had radioed them for help. He had also asked several ships near Unalaska to also head in their direction, though this would take more time. Captain Crisp did everything he could to prepare. The boats were loaded with supplies in case they had to leave the ship before help arrived. And a meeting place was decided on in case the boats got separated. This meeting place was also sent by wireless to the commander in Unalaska. The crew piled their personal effects on the deck of the ship, thinking that they might be able to save them if the Tacoma Maru came to save them as expected. But even as the ship became dangerously full of water, there was no sign of the Tacoma Maru. At 3.15 in the morning of the 21st, Captain Crisp had no choice but to give the order to abandon ship. The Tahoma was now filling with water in such a way that it was making her list more dramatic, and Captain Crisp was beginning to worry how the ship would roll. Not only that, but the sea was becoming rougher, and it was becoming clear that a storm was blowing in. It seemed that even if the ship did not roll, she would break apart soon, battered to pieces by the waves. One last wireless message was sent out to inform anyone nearby as well as the command in Unalaska, that the people on board the Tahoma were taking to the boats. Captain Crisp reassured the crew the best he could that the Tacoma Maru should be there to pick them up soon. They waited all that day, with everyone in the boats, but the boats still tied to the ship, hoping for rescue to come. But as night fell again, Captain Crisp was forced to give the order for the boats to leave the ship. Captain Crisp would later learn that the Tacoma Maru had never been on its way to save them. The ship had gotten their distress message, but due to it being a time of war, the captain of the Tacoma Maru had assumed that the message was a trick by German forces to lure them off course and sink them. The Tacoma Maru had never changed course. The weather was growing worse and staying near the ship was too dangerous no matter how much they were still hoping for a rescue. The boats, six in total, were instructed to head for MacDonald Bay, and soon the weather had scattered them. MacDonald Bay was not the closest land, but Captain Crisp had put a lot of thought into their rendezvous location. Boldir was only 30 miles away from them, while MacDonald Bay was 120 miles away but the current went to the south of Boldir, and the island was small. Captain Crisp was worried that the currents would take his boats off course and head into the Bering Sea, where they would get lost, and be hard to find by any ships looking for them. 
MacDonald Bay had the advantage of the islands of Atu and Agatu stretching through the region, giving them a wide area of land to make landfall on, even with imprecise navigation. And since the ship had just come from Atu, it was a course that the people on the ship were familiar with. Captain Crisp did not sleep at all the night that the ship wrecked, nor the entirety of the next day, as the boat began to be steered towards where they thought MacDonald Bay was. They had seen some of the boats able to use their sails as they departed from the Tahoma, but Captain Crisp had not been in favor of the direction they wanted to go. Instead, he had his men row. It was not until the next morning, when they went to get provisions out of the storage area at the bow of the ship, that they realized that there had been rifles under the compass the entire night. Once the guns were removed, it was found that the guns had dramatically thrown off the compass, and rather than heading toward MacDonald Bay, it was more accurate to say that they were steering for Hawaii. It was no wonder that the other boats had been able to use their sails, but Captain Crisp had thought they were going in the wrong direction. Captain Crisp changed their course to head in the correct direction, but the captain's boat was now far behind the others. Though the Tacoma Maru had not headed in their direction as they had thought, and neither had another steamer named the Senator, which the newspapers speculated was close to them, the calls for help from the Tahoma had not gone unanswered. A coast survey steamer called the Patterson and a whaling ship called the Kodiak were both requested to go in search of the boats of the Tahoma as soon as possible by the commander in Unalaska. Another ship named the Cordova had also picked up the call for help when she was in the harbor of Nome, Alaska. Though she was 950 miles from where the Tahoma had wrecked, the Cordova decided to depart immediately to see if they could be of any assistance. The Coast Survey ship Patterson was not able to head to the site of the wreck of the Tahoma immediately. She was 700 miles away from the wreck and also had other responsibilities. On board, she had the crew of the steamship the Yukon, whom she had picked up to transport to Unalaska. The Patterson had taken shelter safely from the storm during her voyage, but once she got the call that she needed to go save the crew of the Tahoma, the Patterson immediately steered into the storm to reach Unalaska as quickly as possible. They dropped off their passengers and began to bring coal on board for their next voyage, immediately on reaching the port but the weather was still not in their favor. It was not until 5 p.m. on the 22nd that they were able to depart from Unalaska and head for the wreck of the Tahoma. The three would-be rescue ships arrived at the wreck around the same time, midday on the 26th. They were too late. She was already long abandoned. As the captain of a survey ship, the captain of the Patterson took it upon himself to do a thorough inspection of the reef that Tacoma was still resting on. He found that it was two miles in length, and the water over here was only about two fathoms, even though no rocks showed above the surface at any time. The Tacoma was resting almost exactly in the center of this reef, entirely filled with water, and with her bottom ripped out. After discussing the situation with the other ships, the Cordova and the Patterson decided to split the search work. The Patterson would search near the wreck, and the Cordova would go search the area around Agatu Island, where they had been told the boats would be heading. The first group to be picked up was the boat with Captain Crisp in it. They had experienced severe weather throughout, having to furiously bail, and Captain Crisp admitted that he had at one point believed they were going to go to the bottom. But the boats had handled well. They were only about ten miles off of Agatu Island when they saw a steamer's light and fired a rocket into the air. The steamer did not answer at once, so they fired another rocket, and then were met with the steamer's searchlight shining into the sky. 
The Cordova had seen them. As the boat changed its course toward the Cordova, and they saw the Cordova beginning to head in their direction, one of the men asked a very practical question. Quote, Captain, can we have some more water now? End quote. They had been at sea for five days and five nights, and provisions had begun to run low, leading to severe rationing of the water. With help in sight, Captain Crisp agreed, and everyone drank their fill. Once they had picked up Captain Crisp and his men, the Cordova continued into MacDonald Bay and found the Tahoma's dinghy with eight men coming out to beat them. The ship's coxswain, who was in charge of the dinghy, informed the people of the Cordova that on the south side of Agatu, there was one of the ship's lieutenants with more of the crew. The day before, the lieutenant had sent a scouting party to search for other camps, and they had found the coxswain and told him where they were camped. Another camp was found that night by following the lights of a brightly burning fire to where another lieutenant had landed with his group in the sailing launch belonging to the Tahoma on one of the small Elaid Islands. The Cordova was now forced to abandon the search, though, and head to Akutan due to running low on coal. The Patterson was now on her own to find the remaining members of the crew of the Tahoma. On the 28th, the Patterson found the crews of the last three boats on the western point of Agatu Island. 29 people in total, making the entire crew of the Tahoma accounted for. These boats had managed to all stick together, despite the rough weather under the command of First Lieutenant Malloy. They had run entirely out of supplies, and were living off of whatever could be scavenged from the beach and what birds they had been able to hunt, but they were reported in good spirits. No one could deny that with a less capable crew and officers, there would have been a much heavier toll from the accident than just the loss of the Tahoma. Full credit was also given to the Cordova and the Patterson for their meticulous search for the boats until every member of the crew was accounted for. The inquiry into the loss of the Tahoma found no fault with the actions of Captain Crisp and his crew. The Tahoma had been sent on a more southern route than what she was normally told to travel and the reef had been previously completely unknown. There was no way for the crew to know that they were heading directly into danger. The Department of Commerce, under which fell the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, used the loss of both the Yukon and the Tahoma to argue that they should be given the resources to make a more complete survey of the waters around Alaska. If nothing else, Hadn't their ship the Patterson proven her worth in the rescue and transportation of the crews of both ships to safety? The Revenue Cutter Service also had a suggestion to make in light of the loss of the Tahoma, which had been one of their largest and newest vessels. It was time to redesign the spotlights on their ships. That the spotlights got their power through the legs of their supports, and the supports had broken so easily as the Tahoma broke apart was entirely unacceptable. For more information, please see The Master Maiden Pilot from February 1915, or see other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.